membership team, don't go too far. Take a bathroom break, you'll be back soon. I think I'm going to throw out my notes today on Truth Talk and Sermon. Speak to you for a few moments, and uh, then I want us to go back to a time of worship. Um, I, re- I mentioned several weeks ago of looking for a physical whip because I had a sermon that I wanted to preach and I'm going to preach it to you without the whip. So you need to imagine a whip today because I think it will help us understand. Nope, I'm going to skip offering and announcements. You guys can give when we leave. Announcements you got on your talk to us card. There's deadlines, there's information you need to know, so you can look at that. So, I don't even know my scripture text because I haven't developed this. But I'm in the NIV, Sheila. Um, That's the Bible that I read and have marked. So, if you could change to that and try to follow along. In your presence is where I belong. The Lord's wanting to do something this morning in our hearts and bring us back to a place of a worldview of intimacy a lifestyle of intimacy with the Lord. In Exodus chapter 1 is where I want to start. We see the people of God, the Israelites, in Egypt. We are the people of God, and in many ways we're in Egypt. The Bible says in verse 8, Exodus 1 and verse 8, a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. You recall Joseph was there, and he rose to power. The Israelites, they survived the famine. The family moved to Egypt, and they're saved. They're living there, and they begin to increase in number. A new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Verse 9, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So, Egypt put slave masters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. I want you to know that Satan, the system, Egypt, seeks to put slave labor or or slave masters over the people of God to oppress them, to keep them subdued and away from their calling or away from God. Put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And so they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more the Israelites were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread. I want you to know this morning that you live in the midst of a world that you can call Egypt. And there is slave masters that have been strategically put up to hold a whip and to beat you, to to keep you busy, to keep you oppressed, to keep you subdued that you wouldn't rise up into your full calling, that you would never live in the presence of God. You just imagine I had a whip right now. How cool would this be? The system wants to keep you, and so it's beating your back. Stay busy. Produce. We're going to increase your bills. Work. Work. And so the system has slave masters to drive you into the ground that you will never, ever rise up and be the person that God called you to be, that you'd never, God forbid, enter into a season or a place of intimacy with the Lord. But it didn't work. The more they oppressed the Israelites, the more they multiplied and spread, verse 12 says. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, and they continued to work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shiphrah and Puah, When you help the Hebrew women in childbirth, 
and observe them on the delivery stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. That sounds a lot like Acts chapter 5, where the apostle stood up, I believe verse 29, and said, you choose whether it's better to obey God rather than man, right? As for us, we will obey God. Here are two Hebrew midwives that stand up against this Pharaoh, this demonic voice that is a voice of murder, a, a voice of death. The midwives, however, feared God, verse 17, and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, and they let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Notice the people of God pushing back against this death and God continues to bless in the midst of the cracking whip, of the midst of the whip hitting our backs, we must push back and we must stand up and stand for what is right and what is true and what is good. And I'm not even just talking about legally or you know politically and all that stuff matters. I want to specifically, I want you to hear me today on the call of God and intimacy with God. In the midst of the be busy, work, produce, produce there's pushback that we must always have there it is i think that will hurt me or one of you i don't think i'm qualified you know how to run this art <laughs> i can't do this or um someone might lose their head in the front row thank you tony I can at least carry it around. <laughs> just, just try it. See what happens. Try it, the tween said. Well, tweens are in here today. God was kind to the midwives and people increased became even more numerous. God will bless you, church, when you prioritize him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, verse 33. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born you must throw into the Nile. And they continue to increase the pressure on the people of God. Chapter 2, Moses is born. You know the miraculous story. He's put in the basket. He's rescued. And he, he's raised in Pharaoh's own house. God has such a sense of humor. But I want you to see that the people of God thrive even under the whip. Even under the beating. Moses flees then to Midian after he kills an Egyptian. He's pushing back. He's rising up. He has the burning bush experience in chapter 3. God calls Moses to go back to release the children of Israel. Verse 4, we see multiple signs. God proving he's behind Moses. He sends Aaron. And then I want you to see Exodus chapter 5. Verse 1, afterward Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival for me in the worship in the desert. I want you to just, for a moment, imagine this as, Let my people go, so that they may hold worship for me. That they might be quiet before me. That they might serve me. That they might live the way I intended them for, to live. Let my people go. Go, Egypt. Let my people be free from the whip that is beating them and, and cracking down on them and that is, is driving them to such exhaustion. They have nothing left and they can't ever get alone in the presence of God. They, they don't ever have time and they never have enough. They're just beat down. They're beat down. Let my people go. Verse 2, Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take 
a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. The king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous. You can just see Pharaoh looking at his advisors. Look at him thinking this. They are now numerous. And so Moses and Aaron, you are stopping them from working. Verse 6. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave masters and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Do not reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go, let us go. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay a no attention to lies. Church, this is the voice of our culture. Make them work harder so that they pay no attention to church. Make them work harder so they pay no attention to God. Make them work harder. Make them work harder. Harder. Make them produce more. Put in them a desire to, to just constantly never be satisfied. I've got to climb the ladder. My sales have to be bigger next year. I need to make more money. I need to more, own more houses. I need, to, I need to put this within them. Work them to death. Beat them. Suppress them. Make sure they have nothing left inside of them. The spirit of the slave master. Verse 10. Then the slave masters and the foremen went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt. They scattered. Notice the intention of the slave master is to scatter the people of God. To scatter them. To cause them to be just frazzled with never anything left over, constantly run ragged, exhausted. There is no margin in the, Egypt, or in the Israelites' life. There is no such thing as margin. The slave master has beat them, has driven them, has forced them and pushed them. He has created a culture where they're always on the go, always working, always needing to produce, or else you'll never make it. You're going to die if you don't produce the bricks. You're going to die if you don't work six, seven days a week. You're not going to be able to pay your bills. You're going to go under the spirit of the slave master, scattering the people. So they scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. Do you realize that the call of God on you is not to be scattered across here and there, trying to gather straw to make bricks for Egypt. The call of God upon you, church, is to be completely connected to the Lord and from that place live for him. Do not let the slave master, do not let Egypt define your purpose and your calling. Do not let this system that we live in drive you to a place of being scattered and frazzled and no margin and where your the sum of your existence is literally to gather straw and stubble to make bricks for Egypt. Brothers and sisters, you are called to the kingdom not to make bricks for Egypt. Verse 13, the slave masters kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. Verse 14, the Israelite foreman appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers the Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh, why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are, giving, are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. I want you to know the spirit of the slave master, the spirit of our, our culture, our world, is out to manipulate the way you think. 
You are lazy. You are not lazy. The problem is with Egypt. The problem is with Pharaoh. The problem is the system. The problem is the slave masters. But oh no, lazy are you. People of God, you're lazy. What are they doing? They're trying to manipulate and change their worldview and cause them to think it's normal to work seven days a week. It's normal to no longer spend quiet time. I must be lazy. This must be God's will. I must need to live in this existence of scatterbrained and haphazard and looking for straw to make bricks for Egypt. That must be the call. That must be absolutely not. You're lazy. You're lazy. You're lazy. If they say it enough, the people of God begin to believe it. If the system begins to beat you enough, you begin to subdue. There is a slave master that is at work today. And that slave master is directly using busyness to keep you from God. That's basically the extent of my message. So worship team, you guys can get ready. In your presence is where I belong. Intimate, connected, focused on the Lord. But there is a very real slave master. You guys feel the beatings? Have you felt it? How about the last six months? Have you felt the beatings? Have you felt the impact on your budget? Produce. Produce. Work. Be busy. Your kids need to play every sport. You need to work the second job. You need to go and say yes to everything. And at the end of the day, you're crawling in bed exhausted. Having lived for Egypt. And made bricks. And you constantly, every day, hear the scream in your ear. Work. Produce. This is what life is. Church, I'm here to tell you this is not what life is. The spirit, the beating, the lazy that you're hearing spoken over you is from Egypt, not the Lord. The Lord has called us to live in his presence. Business people, hear me. Business is not your purpose in life. Business is awesome. But you are not a slave of Egypt. You are a son or daughter of the Lord. We do not live for Egypt. We do not live to climb the corporate ladder. We do not live for a big retirement. We do not live for houses. We do not live for these things. The spirit of the slave master. Busy. Produce. Produce. And it just keeps nonstop. Every day. Every day. Just keeps beating you. You know what I'm talking about? Have you felt this spirit? You know what I'm talking about. Produce. Produce. This is not the Spirit of God. In His presence is where I belong. In His presence. This is about priorities, and this is ultimately about standing up to a system that wants to beat you into the ground. It'll beat you the whole way till the day you die. You need to make a stand today against the spirit of the slave master that wants to just completely obliterate your life with busyness. You need to stand up and say, let me go. I'm leaving. I refuse to go be scattered. I refuse to live my life running here and there and everywhere just to keep up with the Joneses. I refuse to do anything contrary to what the Lord wants me to do. I refuse to have that whip hit my back every day. I refuse to just do it the natural way. I refuse to just have it that the world and Egypt defines my existence. I will not let my calling be murdered. I will not let my offspring and my, and my future to be destroyed. I will stand up and fight. You realize the children can be naturally paralleled into a spiritual lineage a spiritual offspring if you let the system if you work for bricks and mortar if you work for egypt all day long you won't have a spiritual offspring if you don't get your priorities right your kids aren't going to serve god and your spiritual kids you were called to influence 
you know, there is a sermon, entire another message. I call it Anonymous Ananias. Ananias was the man that ignited the Apostle Paul and went and, and remember Paul was blind. Saul on the road to Damascus and, and the scales on his eyes and they fell off when Ananias, a man of God, walked up to this persecutor, this violent Saul, and gave him a word from God. And it activated the greatest apostle that has ever walked on the face of this earth. The spirit of the slave master wants to beat you that you don't activa- activate Saul of Tarsus. Wants to kill your spiritual kids. Kill your natural kids. He wants you so busy, you're distracted, that you never have time. You never have the ability. He's just beating you, beating you, beating you. And then what happens is Saul remains Saul. And your kids become ensnared in, in the devil. This is the spirit of the slave master. That they would never rise into their potential. That Egypt would always own them. Oh, they might be a Christian, but they are subdued and we beat them every day. Church, I declare over you that you are freed from the spirit of the slave master. We have to come out from under that. We are not to live in Egypt beaten every day. Beaten, beaten. In his presence is where I belong. The spirit of the slave master's number one goal is to keep you from the presence of God. If I had time to develop this sermon, I'm giving you the best I got. If I had time to develop it, there would be multiple points because this is a rich passage. Go study it. Then you can preach it someday. Look at what the spirit of the slave master begins to do. It's a powerful message. I felt prompted this morning to give it to you because in this moment, I believe that we need to spend another 15, 20 minutes in worship specifically before the Lord as we repent, as we process the spirit of the slave master. I wanted to expose this thing this morning. He is fully exposed. It's now your job to deal with this spirit, to deal with this master that wants to beat you and drive you into the ground. This master that's sucking the life out of you, shipwrecking your faith, could be destroying your marriage and family. You know you're outside of the will of God because you're just living for work. That's what it's about. You're a workaholic, and the priorities in your life are out of line. You do not put your marriage, your children, your family, your church, you don't put your God first. This spirit is going to send you to the grave with no lineage. He'll work you to death. The Lord wanted this revealed this morning. So there it is. It's the best I could do. If you guys can lead us in worship, I think the Lord wants us to deliberately get before him. Um, I'm stretching you this morning. If you're watching online, you need to pause in this moment, not miss it. But um, we're going to dim the lights, not to try to create anything, but I want you to just focus in any way possible. And dimming lights can sometimes help us in the natural. Just focus on the Lord. This is real. And this is dangerous. But when we begin to put the Lord first, we can go out of Egypt and into the promised land. This can be broken. And we can find our destiny. And we can reach our destiny. So before I be quiet, you need to know this one thing. The children of Israel were beaten for generations. But there always remained hope as God wanted to take and raise them. If you are someone that has lived for decades beaten by this whip and driven by this whip and your entire life is defined by this whip, your entire existence, your entire family, everything around you has been created by the whip, by the spirit that wants you to be busy and distracted from God, that doesn't want you to live Matthew 6. You need to read Matthew 6. If this is you, you're defined by that. There is hope for you. It does not matter how old you are. God can break this. It can be gone. And you can rise up. And there can be restoration. And there can be a new day. That is the gospel. So even if this is defined you, You need to not wallow in this moment. 
You need to repent of not standing up with the spirit of Moses, the spirit of Aaron, against this oppressive spirit. And say, God, I'm sorry that I've wasted all these years. I've never tapped in. I've never put you first. God, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I confess that I have served the slave masters of Egypt rather than the God of Israel. God, I repent. That is our focus at this point. Not wallowing. Not saying, woe is me. The call is to turn. Repent, yes, but to turn and hear God begin to give you a plan to lead you out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, and begin to have encounters with God at Mount Sinai, and throughout even wilderness seasons that you would then live in the promised land. God can restore you. God can bring back what has been taken from you. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, every journey, every story is different. You need prayer, get me. Get an elder, get a believer. But we should be on our knees before the Lord. You are an American people. And the spirit that has dominated America for a long time has been a spirit that has held a whip. And it has been the embodiment of the spirit of Egypt. And it has been a workaholic culture. Every one of you have felt the strike of this whip. So every one of us are at different places today. But there needs to be a time of repentance and seeking the Lord. In His presence is where I belong. No matter what I have to do in life, no matter how I need to alter my life, He must be number one. It's normal, church. It is normal. We have been brainwashed. We have been taught wrong.